Welcome to the Soldiers and Sailors Monument podcast. I'm Greg Palumbo, Executive Director of the Cuyahoga County Soldiers and Sailors Monument. And with me today is Krista Castillo, our newest caretaker, who will be talking with us today about Christmas during the Civil War. Uh, and most notably for the monument, Patriotic Santa, which we've been depicting over the last several years uh, with his red, white, and blue patriotic suit from the Civil War era. Uh, before we get to that, Chris, I wanted to ask you a little bit about yourself. I know I'm putting you a bit on the spot, but okay. you're coming to us from a pretty prominent position yourself. Yeah. So for 14 years, I managed Fort Negley Visitor Center and Park in Nashville, Tennessee. Um, and Fort Negley is the largest inland masonry fort built during the Civil War. And it's a Union fort, correct? Correct. Yeah. A Union fort in a Confederate capital. Yeah. So it's pretty unique. And built by uh, formerly enslaved and then freed yes. peoples, right? Yes. Yeah. So very interesting. And I'm sure we'll be talking with Krista many more times on this podcast about some of those different uh, items. But today we're specifically talking about Christmas during the Civil War, something that you've done a bit of research about mm -hmm. and have done some talks with uh, um, your with Fort Negley in the past. So um, what what can you tell us about Christmas? What was it like before the Civil War? So amazingly, considering that Christmas is so embedded in Christianity, it's hard to believe that before Christianity, ancient peoples um, were celebrating winter solstice and harvest with a lot of the customs and traditions that we know today. Um, so because winter solstice celebrated or coincided with the end of the harvest, many ancient cultures um, celebrated the gods of agriculture and harvest with um, festivities. The ancient Persians actually celebrated the birth of Mithra, the god of light, on December 25th with feasting, candles, gifts, fire rituals, and evergreen decorations symbolizing life's triumph over death. Wow, that's a uh, so I'm I have a background in classics and I studied generally um, Rome and uh, Greece and ancient Europe. But uh, interesting that the Persians, you know, we always talk about the Druids and the pagans and that mm -hmm. kind of thing. It's interesting that the Persians had a lot more of those things that we think of today uh, as being part of that and the yes. December 25th uh, yeah. date, which is pretty nuts. Yes. So, I mean, although there's not a lot of hard evidence, it's believed that early Christians, in an effort to move pagans from worshiping the sun god to the son of God, um. adopted Mithra's birthday as Jesus's birthday. So it was one of those, you know, kind of little... um just little interesting ways to kind of slowly bring people toward Christianity. And they also adopted a lot of those other things like the evergreen decorations, the gift giving, mm. feasting. And over time, as Christianity spread, those traditions became inextricably linked to Christmas. And we've, we've forgotten about Mithra and the Persians today. Yeah. That's interesting. So, what does it look like in America in the early 1800s as we're bringing the, these different peoples together um, in, in this melting pot of America? Yes. So for centuries, Christmas celebrations across Europe and then in America um, maintained a lot of the characteristics of these pagan celebrations. So they were they were very carnival-like and they could get rowdy. And like their medieval ancestors, um, early American laboring classes didn't have very much to celebrate during the year. So Christmas became kind of like an opportunity to blow off steam and forget about the drudgery of their everyday lives. Um, so needless to say, um, in large 
um, northern cities, the, there were so many glaring inequities that it led to an era of misrule and drunkenness. Mm. And in New York City in 1828, um, an, a Christmas Eve parade became violent and the participants assaulted an African-American church breaking windows and beating worshipers with sticks and ropes. Mm. And at that point, um, it really galvanized efforts in the city to transform Christmas into a holiday focused on children and the family. And that's really um, all due to a group of three men who call themselves the Knickerbockers. Yeah. So the Knickerbockers, um, I I know I did a little bit of research and we've talked a little bit already, but um, interesting group of guys, mm -hmm. uh, men, three men. Uh, I'm sure that they had more people involved, but they were the main drivers. Um, mm -hmm. Tell us a little bit about them. Yeah. So... Um, John Pintard, who was the founder of the New York Historical Society, Clement C. Moore, and the author of A Visit from St. Nicholas, which is more commonly known as Twas the Night Before Christmas, and Washington Irving, author of Rip Van Winkle, took advantage of this emerging focus on ch on children and decided to domesticate Christmas. Mm -hmm. So they took up uh, Moore's um, Twas the Night Before Christmas, his elf-like Santa, you know, putting gifts into stockings hanging by the fire. And they started to introduce those traditions to German churches and uh, Sunday school programs, which already embraced the Christmas tree and Kris Kringle. So leading up to the Civil War, this is an emerging uh, trend. It's something that is not hugely taking grasp yet. Right. But we enter into a period of strife in the United States where on a national scale, we start dividing into us versus them, obviously North versus South, mm -hmm. and bringing together those different cultural groups into military units and uh, merging all of these different people together. So we know that we, um, we've we seen with the Jewish faith, and we'll talk about this in another podcast, uh, uh, but we have the introduction of Harper's Weekly and mm -hmm. their artist, Thomas Nast. Uh, can you tell us a little bit about Thomas's background and why he might be making an interesting connection to those groups that are starting to turn toward children? Yeah, so Thomas Nast was a an immigrant from Germany. Um, he came to the United States as a child. He didn't do very well in school, so his parents enrolled him in in art school where he excelled. Um, his his interest in politics seems to have begun from a young age because his father um, was what you would call maybe a political dissident in Germany. So they were actually escaping Germany when they came to the United States. And Thomas Nass, like most artists, started out as, you know, a contract worker with several different newspapers. Um, prior to the war, he traveled around Europe, sketching the war in Italy. And then he returned to the United States just before the outbreak of the Civil War and took a position with Harper's Weekly. Okay. And for Harper's Weekly, he's um, doing these etchings that are on their cover. Well, we should talk a little bit about Harper's Weekly. So Harper's Weekly is a magazine mm -hmm. that is coming at a time when, uh, you know, news needs to be, you know, widespread. So it's not, it's a national paper, not your local newspaper. Um, and it is creating this large scale viewership, mm -hmm. uh, subscription base, and is going to soldiers as well. Mm -hmm. uh, do you have know much about Harper's Weekly? So at a time when the, when most Americans were largely illiterate, mm -hmm. um, illustrations were very important and um, Harper's Weekly was the most widely subscribed to newspaper in the United States. And partially um, that was because 
in addition to the cost of the subscription, they did not charge a delivery fee. Mm. So the paper was uh, popular north and south. And during the Civil War, a Harper's Weekly subscriptions actually went up in the south, which is pretty surprising when you look at um, the political illustrations from satirists like Thomas Nass and others, because they were not necessarily um, favorable to the South. Yeah, fairly Northern leaning, uh, yes. I would say. Mm-hmm. Uh, to where we get to our most significant to the monuments Christmas celebration mm-hmm. is the depiction of patriotic Santa on the cover of Harper's Weekly. Yeah. So Thomas Nast was, was, had a very illustrious career, but what we remember him for, or maybe we don't remember him at all, but we recognize Santa Claus, which he developed over a period of four decades. And it remains his most enduring legacy. Um, Most people don't recognize his vast gallery of illustrations, but everyone is, is familiar with Santa Claus who was um, uniformed in a red suit with the white fur trim, delivering gifts around the world. And NASA's most iconic images of Santa would go on to um, influence everything from the Santas we see at the mall today to Coca-Cola advertising campaigns to uh, pottery barn salad plates. Yeah, we we see that uh, Coca-Cola Santa Claus is being, oh, that's the American Santa Claus. Right. That's the one that we all know and love. But he really looks like Thomas Nast's Santa Claus from the 1880s. He does. He does. And, you know, more, you know, aside from the Knickerbockers, Thomas Nast is really responsible for that domestication Mm. and evolution of Santa Claus. And his earliest depictions really draw heavily on Moore's elusive Dutch elf. And over time, Nast morphs him into in a, the approachable giant of a man that we recognize today. And I think a lot of that has to do with the United States searching for an identity and that, you know, the, the United States required someone like Nast Santa, someone larger than life. Nast Santa during the Civil War on the cover of Harper's Weekly and, and in its pages, mm-hmm. is not wearing the traditional red suit with the white cuffs. Exactly. Yeah. He um, he adapted the, the American flag as Santa Claus's suit in his very first illustration, Santa Claus in Camp, mm-hmm. that actually appeared after Christmas. And, you know, that's where you get into um, NAS political prowess. Throughout that illustration, um, there are clues, very overt clues, as to Santa Claus's allegiance. Particularly where it comes to the toys and the one that he's handing to the the, uh, soldiers is Jefferson Davis. Yes, dangling by the neck. Yes. Yes. And and Nast is also very careful to... Put the the two young boys unwrapping mm-hmm. the jack in a box, jack in the box, in the foreground again. Um, you know, focusing on that that Christmas is a holiday for children. Yeah, these are uh, assumably drummer boys that are yeah uh, yeah that are yeah. getting toys. Yes. So, yeah. Yeah. Interesting. I had our our caretaker, former caretaker Warren Doyle, uh, spent years developing his version of patriotic santa's uh uniform uh based off of that drawing and we at the monument have patriotic santa uh visited by hundreds of children a year uh thousands almost um of so that we can kind of make that link uh to christmas and to the winterland uh festivities that happen here in cleveland with the tree lighting on the tree lighting day, we are pretty much all patriotic Santa Claus. 
but uh, Warren did show me uh, as he was developing, you know, he really picked apart every detail of that etching. And he looked at the face of Santa Claus and saw an African-American face. Really? That's um, interesting. So his, his feeling was that Nast may have been trying to make a little bit of a uh, jab there as well. Uh, but up for debate, the etchings continue, though, uh, throughout the Civil War. And we see large interior spreads in yes. Harper's uh, that have some other depictions of Santa Claus and some of the things that Santa Claus does. Yeah, and it's interesting that in the very same issue that Santa Claus in camp appears, um, his double-page spread, Christmas Eve, also appears. And Santa is not prominently featured, but he's not clad in the patriotic Santa suit. Mm -hmm. He's wearing, you know, the the fur-trimmed suit that we associate with him today. And in the the his Christmas Eve etching, there's much more of a focus on the the family and the the loneliness, longing, and hope. Mm. Um, that that separated families are experiencing, and for a Christmas illustration, he gets a, he gets a little dark because he does feature little vignettes of a battle, yeah. um, the stormy seas that the that the country is experiencing, and then in the center, surrounded by laurel, um, are the gravestones of the soldiers who are not able to celebrate Christmas that year. Yeah. Those that won't be coming home. We do see in that image, though, some of the um, things we recognize with Santa Claus um, being pulled by his sleigh being pulled by reindeer. Yes. Uh, going down chimney. Yeah. And the sleeping children uh, you yes. know, waiting. You yeah. Know, sugar plums in their heads, perhaps. Yes. Uh, but uh, we do. It, it's really two sides of that coin. As the war continues, uh, we go on. We see Santa Claus a handful more times. Mm -hmm. And then we get into uh, Santa Claus after the war. Yes. Um, so Nass, most of Nass depictions of Santa Claus and his Christmas depictions during the war um, are emotional. And so by 1863, um, his two-page illustration, Christmas 1863, is starting to show the full effects of the war. Um, so there's it features a northern family reunited, if only for a little while. Um, and you can tell by looking at it that the north is still well supplied. The mm. children have presents. There's a feast. But you also, you know... If you know your history, you know you're reminded that Southerners were feeling the full force of the blockade, um, and things were getting tight. And so, so through this um, illustration, NASA is, is able to offer these subtle clues to the to the North's advantages over the South. Then in 1864, um, Nass' only Christmas drawing during the Civil War that does not include Santa, um, he uses a purely political um, illustration to demonstrate what's going on in the country. Um, so by this point, Lincoln had handily won re-election. Grant's aggressive strategy is crippling the South. And by December, the Union was celebrating the capture of Savannah and the defeat of John Bell Hood's army in Nashville. So those events kind of alleviated the North's outcry uh, to end the war. And at this point, the Confederacy's future looked really bleak and troops were deserting in record numbers. So Union Christmas dinner features Lincoln welcoming the governors of the states in rebellion back to the sumptuous feast mm. of the Union. And he uses American imagery that is very familiar to most people, like the you know, a symbolized figure of victory, the American eagle, the olive branch of peace, um, the parable from the Bible with the, with the forgiving father, and the rebellious son. So we're getting to a point where 
the war is wrapping. Uh, Nast and Harper's Weekly are understanding that there's that we're going to need to come back together as a nation. What what is the difference then post war? How we see the North and South starting to come back together in that respect. Well, and I mean, I can only I can really only speak to NAS perspective mm. on reunification. So in eighteen sixty five um, Harper's Weekly publishes NAS, A Merry Christmas to All. And it's a blend of NAS traditional Christmas scenes, mm. um, but then it's also political satire. And I think this illustration really encapsulates NAS personality because his Christmas drawings were like a safety valve for him as well during the year. Um, it gave him the opportunity to kind of turn away from politics and let his imagination run wild. Mm. But in this illustration, he combines the two. So he's, there's a very, you know, cheeky Santa Claus winking at the viewer over a snowball fight. And there's a boy and a girl featured with, you know, popular Christmas toys. But then he takes the the Christmas pantomime, which was pretty popular with Victorians, and he's depicting um, Ulysses the giant killer surrounded by the severed heads of the United States enemies, Lee, Longstreet, and Johnston. So you have to really wonder, is Thomas Nast really wishing a Merry, a Merry Christmas to all, or is it a Merry Christmas to all with a caveat? that you remember what you've done to the nation. Mm. So I think I think maybe at that point the country was ready to move on, but Thomas Nast wasn't necessarily. And it seems like this time of reconciliation, but the country was still reeling from Lincoln's assassination and the 13th Amendment had just been passed, ending slavery. So there was a lot of question about where is the country going from here? Yeah. So we get a different nast Santa Claus as we start to progress from that point. We see I, I can understand, you know, NAS is probably fed up and reeling just like everybody else, but we do start to come back together. And now Santa Claus starts to take on a larger role. Yes. So by 1866, his Christmas drawing, Santa Claus and his works is I think one of the most fun and one of the most important. And it's because he's really trying to humanize Santa and he's trying to make Santa um, different from the Pels Nicole of his German childhood, mm -hmm. which was a more punitive Santa Claus who would deliver gifts for the nice, but also punishment to the naughty. And a lot of this has to do with um, Nass growing family. As his child, as he has children and his children grow older, his Santa Claus is softening and becoming more approachable. Um, so there in this drawing, there's a series of vignettes, and you know, you get the sense that Santa Claus is this mythical character who has the ability to fly around in a sleigh and deliver presents around the world in one night. But Santa also has to make all those toys by hand. He doesn't have any elves at this point. He has to put up his own Christmas tree. And then after the holidays, he needs to kick back by the fire and recuperate just like everybody else. This drawing is also the first time that the North Pole is linked with Santa Claus. So it's it's very um, subtle in an upper corner, but it, it mm. NASA says that Santa lives at Santa Clausville, the North Pole. And because polar expeditions had been so popular in the years leading up to the Civil War, you know, everybody in America was familiar that NP meant North Pole. Mm. And this etching is in color. 
Yes. Yeah. So yeah. we get to see that that uh, color that he had intended for Santa Claus to be. Yes. Uh, you know, yeah. Prior in the etchings that we had talked about where he's in patriotic, you know, garb, mm -hmm. it's understandable. This is blue. This is red and white because right. it's the American flag. But when we see him in a in a dark color suit, German things to that point were generally green. Right. Uh, we saw a lot of blue Santa Clauses in the world, uh, that kind of thing, where now he is starting to standardize us to the red suit. Yes. And this this illustration is also important because you know it's it's believed that one of the reasons Nast assigned Santa's home to the North Pole, other than it's isolated so he can carry out his duties throughout the year without interference, and it's perpetually covered in snow, it's also independent from all from all other nations. Mm. So Nass being this po the political activist that he was, it's as if he's saying, look, Santa belongs to everyone. Yeah. Not No one nation can claim him as their own. Truly an international hero, right. if you will. Right. right. So that brings us back around to Christmas today. So we we see a lot of this, you know, we get a little bit of commercialization, a little more refinement, mm -hmm. elves introduced at some point. Right. Uh, but really, Nast has created the foundation, uh, starting with the Knickerbockers and mm -hmm. their foundation and expanding upon that. You might say that they were the base level. They were the base level and he put the bricks in. Uh, but we end up with what we know today is Santa Claus. Yeah. And, and Nast's um, most iconic... Santa Claus was published in 1881, again in full color. And, you know, and he, he has his sack of toys. He has the military inspired toys, uh, which were popular at the time, but also illustrate NAS overwhelming support for the military. Interestingly, at that time, there was also a uh, a huge debate in Congress over raising the pay of soldiers and sailors. So NAST incorporated those military undertones as a way of saying, you need to pay soldiers and sailors what they're due. Um, also in 1889, um, Harper, Harper's and Brothers published Thomas NAST's Christmas Drawings for the Human Race, which is available for download online for free. Um, and it's a really amazing book because he has his Christmas drawings, but then he also incorporates Mother Goose. Hmm. So this book further um, defined Santa's character and further humanized Santa really for the world. And it's it's kind of interesting that when you look at Santa and you look at pictures of Nast, you can see how he incorporated his own characteristics <laughs> into Santa. And, you know, his biographer said that, you know, his children believed that Nast was Santa because everyone understood that Nast was so integral in that development of Santa. Down to his mustache. Right. Those early etchings, you don't really see a prominent mustache. Yeah. And then this 1881 drawing we see. Nast's very own uh, facial hair on yeah. Santa Claus. Yeah, and Nast was, you know, he was he was shorter than what we think of as Santa, but you know, he was kind of a a plump individual. <laughs> so, you know, did he also, you know, blend Moore's plump little elf to with um his more humanized version? Huh of Santa Claus. And, and I think that's one of the really endearing qualities about Thomas Nass was that he had no problem making fun of himself. So mm -hmm. I really encourage people to look at Nass artwork. I mean, over 2000 illustrations and cartoons appeared in Harper's weekly alone. Wow. So, I mean, prolific. there's, yeah, I mean, and there's, there's a lot to see. That's excellent. Well, anything else that we should cap with i mean when you're at the mall visiting santa remember thomas nass yeah because he's worth he's definitely worth remembering absolutely and definitely remember him with us every 
Christmas season. Uh, we have Patriotic Santa at the monument uh, the Saturday after Thanksgiving for the Winterland festivities. He's there all day long. And then usually a couple of Saturdays throughout December um, whenever Warren Doyle is available to portray him. So uh, I want to say thank you very much to Warren for his time as our Patriotic Santa over the years and hopefully for many to come. Uh, I want to thank you for joining us today. Thank you, Krista, for your information on Santa Claus and Christmas during the Civil War. And welcome to the team. Thank you. We're glad to have you. We hope you'll join us in person at the Monument. We are open daily, 10 a.m. to 5.30 p.m. And particularly to see Patriotic Santa the last weekend in November. Uh, see you next time.